I love Walking with Dinosaurs. I must have watched it for the first time when I was about three or four, not long after it originally aired, and since then I've re-watched it again and again and again. As the years went on and I watched it more though, it became apparent that certain parts of this series had not stood the test of time too well, as paleontology and technology progressed, but to me at least, this still never took away from the magic of Walking with Dinosaurs. As of October 2019, it's been exactly 20 years since this program first came to TV, and much has changed since then. I've seen a few requests of people asking me to talk about this series, and given the timing, this seems like a pretty good opportunity to do that. Had I been a lot smarter about this and far more prepared, it would have been pretty fun to do one of these videos a week for all six episodes as the date of their 20th birthdays went by, but I didn't actually realise until too late when they had first aired. Nevertheless, here we are. We're going to start with just the first episode for now, looking at the accuracies, inaccuracies, and overall effectiveness and enjoyment of it. But, if you like this sort of video, I'd be more than happy to cover every episode of the original series, and perhaps eventually even some of the spin-offs and specials. As I've already made apparent, I really do love this series, but it's definitely not perfect, and so any criticisms I make of this wonderful program are made out of love for it and respect to all those involved, as I'll be forever grateful that such a unique and truly special series, the likes of which had never been seen before and still, to this day, has never quite been seen again, was produced, helping a great deal to nurture and inspire my love of dinosaurs and the history of life on Earth. Despite the many criticisms Walking with Dinosaurs has received from paleontologists, most of which is admittedly completely valid, due to its inaccuracies and fairly speculatory nature in some parts, I think the thing this series has done so well is in its portrayal of these creatures, which before this point had only really been shown as vicious monsters when on screen, as real, believable animals that weren't just constantly hunting and being hunted, but performing other behaviours you could quite easily see in a nature documentary about modern animals. This is done much better in this show compared to many others, and for all its errors and controversial decisions, at least it treats its subjects as real animals. So here we go, the scientific accuracy of Walking with Dinosaurs Episode 1, New Blood. This episode takes place during the late Triassic period, being based on discoveries made in the Chinle Formation, and with the episode stating that it specifically occurs in Arizona. There are three main story focuses within this instalment that of the Coelophysis, the Cynodonts, and the Postosuchus, although several other prehistoric animals are also featured, such as Placerius, Platyosaurus, and the Pterosaur Pitinosaurus. Let's begin this examination of the show's accuracies and inaccuracies by looking at the main dinosaur star of the first episode, Coelophysis. Now, clearly one of the most noticeable features of this dinosaur design is the lack of any sort of feathery integument. To be fair, there is currently no direct evidence of feathers in this specific theropod. However, given how widespread it's been found that feathery filaments likely were amongst dinosaurs, and even probably among other archosaurs, it would be a reasonable assumption to make that Coelophysis presumably possessed feathers to some extent. But, despite the first direct evidence of feathered non-avian dinosaurs having already been published at the time Walking with Dinosaurs was being created, it would have been even more speculative at that point to assume that feathers were that basal to theropods. Perhaps a few sparse filaments could have been a nice touch, although apparently adding any fur or feathers to a model significantly increased the cost and difficulty of animating and compositing the creature, so it's understandable that this was avoided in this case. Another major anatomical inaccuracy present in the Coelophysis design is of course the fact that the hands are pronated, something we know that theropods were incapable of doing due to the way the bones in their arms and wrists were articulated. Instead of the palms of the hands facing backwards, they should in fact face inwards and towards each other. The coloration of the Coelophysis in this episode, while obviously being completely speculative, is nevertheless a very striking and attractive looking design, as are many of the colours of the creatures in the show, producing an iconic look for this dinosaur, especially with the red markings on the head. However, the designs failed to take into account the well-documented sexually dimorphic nature of this dinosaur. Since so many fossils of Coelophysis have been found, this has allowed paleontologists to realise that there are two distinctive morphs of these animals, with a more gracile form being found to probably represent females, and a more robust form representing male individuals. But in New Blood, all the Coelophysis models are exactly the same in their proportions. Another slightly odd error is the fact that this episode is said to take place 220 million years ago, when in fact the Coelophysis genus is only known from rocks as old as 216 million years. 
The behaviour of Coelophysis seen in this episode has brought about some controversies too, as towards the end it's shown that one of the adults has cannibalised a youngster. This behaviour is based on fossils of these dinosaurs that were claimed to show the bones of juveniles preserved inside the body cavities of fully grown individuals. However, later research showed that these particular specimens in fact contained the bones of crocodilomorphs, and not the bones of their own species. Additionally, one of these specimens was also found to have just been deposited on top of the bones thought to belong to a juvenile, and therefore they were never actually stomach contents. Although, an argument can still be made for cannibalism in Coelophysis, as a paper from 2009 described new fossil evidence that preserved what was interpreted by the paleontologists as regurgitated material around the head and neck area of an adult individual, and among the bone fragments identified in this region are some bits of skull and several teeth, the anatomy of which look identical to that of a juvenile Coelophysis. So, this theropod still quite possibly practised cannibalism, and therefore this behaviour shown in Walking with Dinosaurs might still be valid, just not based on the right fossils. Next, we'll move on to another of the stars of this first episode, Postosuchus. Luckily, unlike Coelophysis, this animal was in fact actually around 220 million years ago, living from 221 million years ago to about 203 million years ago, and has indeed been found in the Chini Formation in Arizona. This is another iconic and beautiful looking animal design. However, the major flaw in this reconstruction is how it is portrayed as a quadrupedal creature. Described in this episode as too front heavy to run on two legs, the locomotion of this archosaur was disagreed on by paleontologists around the time the episode was being made, with an older publication suggesting that Postosuchus and other members of its family may have been capable of bipedalism, but then a more recent paper at the time of Walking with Dinosaurs production finding that the massive pectoral girdle, among other features of the forelimbs, suggested the animal actively utilised its front legs in its locomotion. But, they also noted how this didn't rule out the possibility of Postosuchus also walking on two legs sometimes. However, in 2013 there was a study published which thoroughly examined the known body skeleton of Postosuchus, which is actually represented by some fairly complete remains, discovering that there are all kinds of characteristics indicating it was likely an obligate biped, meaning it only ever walked on two legs. This evidence included the limb proportions, the hands being much smaller than the feet, the very reduced digits on the hands, and features of the spine. A lot of these anatomical details were found to be pretty similar to many theropod dinosaurs, which were mostly all bipedal, and therefore the study concluded that Postosuchus would likely have been a biped too. So this is definitely a bit of outdated paleontology in the show, but to be fair there are a few scenes where the animal is shown rearing up on its hind legs, likely paying recognition to the ongoing debate at the time as to how it moved. But science and our knowledge of prehistory has progressed and we can now say with more certainty that Postosuchus wouldn't have moved like it does here. This brings us to the other main issue to do with Postosuchus, and oh what a controversy it is. In this episode, one of these animals is shown urinating. Oh no. This generated a storm of angry people complaining about this supposed inaccuracy, but as it turns out, these objections are actually not particularly valid. The problem that many people had with this behaviour being shown is that it's a widely held belief that living archosaurs, that is, birds and crocodilians, don't actually urinate at all, instead expelling all their waste at once and secreting solid uric acid, and not urea containing fluids. So the Postosuchus, another member of the archosaurs, shouldn't be producing all that urine. However, Crocodilians and birds do actually make both of these compounds in their bodies, as do mammals, but unlike mammals, modern archosaurs generally produce more uric acid than urea, whereas we produce more urea. When birds and crocodilians release the white coloured uric acid, there is in fact almost always some watery fluid containing urea that accompanies it. And, sometimes, these animals will store a great deal of this liquid inside their colons and intestines, before then releasing everything out of their cloacas at once. In birds, this often appears as a white coloured stream of liquid, due to the white, solid uric acid being mixed in, but in crocodilians it can be quite clear and even yellowish, as the Postosuchus urine is in this episode. There are many videos across the internet of crocodilians and ostriches especially urinating that aren't difficult to find, and in many cases the birds will urinate before then immediately defecating. In addition, there's actually some interesting trace fossil evidence of non-avian extinct dinosaurs potentially urinating, with one site in Colorado preserving a large depression amongst a trackway that looks very similar to the shape produced by pouring water onto sand from the approximate height of a large dinosaur. 
Another locality is in Brazil, where two traces clearly made by liquid pouring onto sand dunes were found, and the only things around in this area to pour liquid from a large height would have been dinosaurs. Anyway, I certainly ended up doing more research into Arkosaur urination than I expected I would ever have to do. But, as you can see, the urinating Postosuchus isn't actually as far-fetched as some people thought it was, since living members of its lineage do indeed urinate, and there's some evidence that even extinct dinosaurs probably did too. So, while controversial, this behaviour is in fact entirely plausible, though clearly it would have been a waste of water still. Next, we come to the tragic tale of the Cynodonts. The struggle of these animals to survive and protect their young throughout the episode is perhaps one of the best examples of a particular individual or individuals being used to tell a compelling story in the series, and the outcome of their predicament, in which they're forced to eat their own babies, is both heartbreaking and unexpected. But unfortunately, they shouldn't actually be there at all. While never specifying which genus these cynodonts belong to in the show, in one of the accompanying books they're apparently referred to Thrinaxodon. This genus, however, is in the completely wrong time and place to be featured in this episode, as these animals are only known from about 250 million years ago in South Africa and Antarctica, not 220 million years ago in North America. However, apparently the cynodonts shown in the episode are based on the fact that some cynodont teeth are known from the Chinle formation, though whatever animal they belonged to is currently unnamed. So, the design of the mysterious Chinle cynodont for this episode is heavily based on what we understand Thranaxodon to have looked like, even though it did not live here. Something that Walking with Dinosaurs definitely got right with the cynodonts though, is that these animals were certainly burrowing creatures. There is a 251 million year old partial burrow cast from South Africa, which preserves the entire skeleton of a Thranaxodon inside, presenting the earliest known evidence of burrowing in cynodonts, and also suggesting that this behaviour may have developed as a response to the dramatic changes in climate that occurred during the massive extinction event just before the Triassic. Another pretty nice detail with the cynodonts is the presence of whiskers. While still speculative to some degree, this feature is based on evidence found in the fossils of this animal, with a publication from 1961 that examined the cranial anatomy of Thranaxodon, finding that it possessed many small openings in the nasal bones of the skull, which is possibly indicative of sense organs such as whiskers. Clearly the extent of hair coverage over the rest of the body is complete speculation in this model, but the amount shown is not unreasonable. The assertion that the cynodonts laid eggs is also pretty accurate, since this would probably have been the ancestral state for the group, as indicated by the fact that today the monotremes still lay eggs, while only therian mammals give live birth. This brings us next to Placerius. These creatures are indeed in the correct time and place for the episode, living about 220 million years ago and being known from fossils found in the Chinle Formation in Arizona. Despite this though, it's possible that Placerius would not actually have been a very common sight at this time. This is because, although known from several hundred fossil specimens, most Placerius remains are concentrated in a single location in Arizona, called the Placerius Quarry. Outside of this locality though, these Dicynodonts are pretty rare, meaning it's likely that this high number of individuals represents an unusual accumulation of this species, and in reality they would have been a scarce sight, and possibly not as ubiquitous as shown in Walking with Dinosaurs. Though to be fair, the episode is following a single herd, so the abundance of Placerius is probably excusable. As for the look of the creatures, luckily many specimens of this animal are known from that quarry, so the reconstructions in the episodes generally look quite good, though obviously some hair coverage would have been likely in this species, and in Dicynodonts and even Therapsids in general, as indicated by discoveries of coprolites from their predators that contain traces of hair. Another thing that's said in this episode is that Placerius is one of the last of its kind, an endangered species. However, it's now known that Dicynodonts actually continued to exist for a while longer, with species such as the very recently named Lysowickia being found in even later Triassic rocks. A criticism that people have pointed out in the past is that there's evidence that Dicynodonts had, in fact, even survived until the Cretaceous, citing very fragmentary fossils found in Australia. However, these have been recently determined to more likely belong to a Cenozoic mammal. So yes, the Dicynodonts were dying out. It just wouldn't have happened as soon as the episode seems to indicate. There's also a species of pterosaur that makes an appearance in this first chapter, named as Petinosaurus. While this reptile was another species that indeed lived 220 million years ago, the fossil remains of Petinosaurus are only known from Europe, not North America where the episode is set. 
However, in fairness, Kenneth does mention how it is an exotic hunter from far and wide, likely showing how it was understood that this creature lived in a different locality, and would have had to travel over a massive distance across the supercontinent Pangaea to reach the region where Coelophysis was living. Still, it's highly unlikely that this pterosaur would have come into contact with the other animals shown in the episode. A nice bit of behaviour is demonstrated here when the Patinosaurus preys on ancient dragonflies, an action that is quite plausible for this animal, as it is indeed thought to have been insectivorous. As for the actual model of the reptile, the head is probably a little bit smaller than it really would have been, but there's also an interesting detail of a light coat of pycnofibers on this animal, the hairy filaments that pretty much all pterosaurs would have possessed in life. While probably not nearly as dense as it should be, it's cool to see that this bit of anatomy had been incorporated into the animal's design, adding to the authenticity of its look. Other parts of the pterosaur's anatomy are not as accurate though, with wingtips that appear much too pointed, whereas it's now understood that pterosaurs likely had more rounded wingtips than those shown here. Additionally, when the Pitinosaurus lands, its wings fold in from the sides, which would not have been possible. Instead, pterosaur wings would have folded in from the back, with the metacarpals rotating and causing the digits to point more towards the rear. Finally, there's the Platyosauruses which turn up at the end of the episode. Unfortunately, these animals aren't in the right time either, as the genus only appeared 214 million years ago, and most remains of Platyosaurus are known from Europe. However, there is some evidence of this genus's presence in Greenland, as fragments of bone that are very similar looking to this dinosaur have been recovered in East Greenland, and consequently referred to the genus. The anatomy of the dinosaur shown in this episode has become quite a bit outdated too, since the animals walk on all fours here. At the time the episode was produced, there was still a bit of a debate over how Platyosaurus moved about, However, many paleontologists thought that a mostly quadrupedal lifestyle was very likely, with the occasional switch to bipedalism when the animals moved faster. The reconstructions shown in the episode seem to reflect the science of the time, showing most individuals moving quadrupedally, but also having one of them briefly rear up onto two legs. But, since the episode aired, there has been a complete change in how we understand Platyosaurus locomotion. A study published in 2007 discovered that this dinosaur was actually incapable of pronating its hands, due to the way the forelimb bones articulate with each other, which were manipulated by paleontologists to see what their actual range of motion would have been. Without the ability to pronate its hands, Platyosaurus would have been forced to walk only on its hind limbs, a discovery further supported by the fact that, like in Postosuchus as we discussed earlier, the arms were much shorter than the legs, and when digital models of Platyosaurus were constructed, it was found that the centre of mass was positioned right over the back legs. This also means that Platyosaurus walked on two legs no matter the speed it was travelling at, and probably did not walk on all fours at any point, except possibly as hatchlings. There may also be a slight issue with some shrink wrapping of the Platyosaurus design, since at some angles you can sort of see the outline of some skull openings, such as the Antorbital Fenestra, though it doesn't seem to be a major problem. And again, these animals have a particularly nice looking colour scheme that gives the creatures a very iconic appearance. Before we end this video, I also want to quickly discuss the more entertainment focused side of things too. Firstly, the music. Now, I should probably leave it to Matt to discuss it more fully, but personally I love every track in the episode, as they're all incredibly effective at adding to the sense of a harsh and unforgiving environment that the episode concentrates on so much. And then of course the iconic and triumphant Time of the Titans theme that plays at the end as the Platyosaurus arrive. In later episodes, especially the beautiful but tragic Giant of the Skies, the music then gets even better in my opinion, and has to be one of the very best things that helps to make this series so special. Another excellent part of this series is the narration, with the original by Sir Kenneth Branagh adding so much to the magic of the show, with his brilliant shifts in tone perfectly portraying the emotions of the scene. The Discovery Channel version replaces Branagh with Avery Brooks, and though I haven't seen it before, I've always been a fan of Benjamin Sisko so I'm sure he's excellent as well. Of course, one of Walking with Dinosaurs' greatest achievements was its use of CGI, which, although in some cases doesn't always look that great today, was truly revolutionary at the time of its production. Heavily inspired by the success and incredible looking dinosaurs of Jurassic Park, it was always going to be a challenge to create approximately three hours of dinosaur footage for this documentary, as opposed to just the six minutes of CG dinosaurs in the film, but they managed to pull it off. Originally it was planned for Walking with Dinosaurs to focus more on the scenery, plants and insects, with only the occasional animated dinosaur making an appearance, but luckily they ended up filling the program with dinosaurs once they found a cheaper way to do the CGI. 
An interesting point mentioned by the creator Tim Haynes himself is that the show sort of tricks the audience in many ways into believing they saw what they wanted to see, without actually explicitly showing it, as a way to reduce the cost of the CGI. I think an example of this from the first episode would be the post asukas attack on the Placerius. The actual action is blocked by the body of the Dicynodont, but you know what's happening behind it, and can imagine the bloody incident without even seeing the biting. It still doesn't take away from the value of the series, but it's an interesting thing to note. Another random fact that Tim Haynes mentioned which is pretty interesting is that when the Coelophysis walks into frame before it hunts the longfish, you can see how it steps in behind all these small piles of dirt on the ground. That's because it looked like the dinosaur was actually floating and the feet weren't touching the soil properly when it was first composited, so they decided to hide the feet with the piles. Just an amusing point I thought you might find interesting. Anyway, the use of animatronic puppets is always good too, and the models look very nice in every shot they're in, understandably often looking better than the CGI. My favourite from this episode has to be the dying Postosuchus, which looks incredibly creepy with its pupil lacking eyes, and the blending of the practical Postosuchus with the digital Coelophysis is quite impressive for the time. And finally, the overall story of the rise of the dinosaurs throughout the episode is an excellent way of introducing the series and its primary focus. Despite the way in which the dinosaurs are presented as far better adapted than the Postosuchus not necessarily being very accurate, since Postosuchus would really have been a far more formidable creature than it's shown in the episode. Still, especially with the arrival of the time wandering Platyosaurus at the end, it leads in nicely to the second episode of the series. The emotional story of the Cynodonts is also a nice touch, and introduces a theme that then seems to be replicated in later episodes, especially Giant of the Skies, with harrowing stories of particular individuals and the lives they led in their prehistoric worlds. Well, that's pretty much everything I wanted to say on this episode, and it's gone on long enough now anyway. I have no doubt that I've probably missed some other details, so let me know if there are any inaccuracies or accuracies you think I should have mentioned. I hope you enjoyed this review of New Blood, it's been very fun for me to go through it and discover what was right and wrong about the animals shown in the episode, and I feel like doing this has given me a new sort of appreciation for walking with dinosaurs, allowing me to better understand what is really based in science or not in this vision of prehistory. Anyway, let me know if you'd like me to continue reviewing this series, there's certainly a lot more to say about each of the episodes. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you would like to find out more about our world, its history, and the wonderful life that surrounds us all, please feel free to subscribe to the channel if you think we deserve it, and if you would like to see more from us.